All right. So the objective of today's lesson on February 19, 2021, is to synthesize the information that you will need in order to master the three standards from this unit. And the essential question that we seek to answer by the end of today's lesson is what knowledge do I need to have in order to master Monday's unit for exam? So that means that if you come to the conclusion that you don't have some knowledge that you do need, today is your day to get those questions at least prepared. You don't necessarily have to ask them today or get them answered. Maybe you need to take the weekend to look over your notes or to complete some assignments, but you at least wanna know what do I know and what don't I know? And what do I need to know? What's the gap between my knowledge and what I, I need to know? So make sure you've got your notebook out per usual. It is a review day, so we will not be adding anything new, but it gives us an opportunity to go over things and add to and perfect our notes. Osue, thanks for joining us. Let's go ahead and jump into it. So before we actually get to the content for today, I wanted to provide you all with some reminders. Number one, the exam is on Monday, February 22nd, which is this coming Monday. Please be prepared for that. I don't want anybody to be shocked when that slide comes up to navigate to SchoolNet. We should know now that the test is coming up and you all need to take this test as you need to take all tests. That also means that all of your unit four assignments will be due at 11.59 p.m. on Monday. So I have now extended all of the due dates on Canvas to be Monday at 11.59 p.m. They were previously today, but of course, in conversation with the two other biology teachers, we decided that Monday would be the better test day. So you all have a few more days to get prepared. I wanna remind you to focus on the asynchronous assignments. The asynchronous assignments are those that start with U blank, D blank. For example, U4, D5, or U4, D2. Those are the assignments that not only are worth more points, but in effect, they are the second half of our learning experience this semester. The lecturing is only the first half. Actually practicing the concepts that you are taught during the lectures is just as important as paying attention during the lecture. In fact, it might even be more important. So you really need to make sure that you are getting these assignments submitted. Unfortunately, as we currently stand, uh, many of you are missing 10, 15, almost 20 assignments. And I say many of you, including all of my biology students, not just those, those of you in this class. But we've got some students who are digging a deep hole for themselves. Don't let that hole be any deeper. Dedicate two hours this weekend. Two hours is not much time in the grand scheme of things. Between three o'clock today and 8 a.m. on Monday, I know we need to sleep, we need to get rejuvenated, we enjoy and deserve family time, time with friends, time with pets, music, video games, junk food, whatever you're into in terms of how you spend your weekend, church, temple, whatever it is. I get all of that, but school, really more specifically learning, also deserves to get some of your attention. So please make sure you're getting these assignments done. Don't let yourself fall any deeper. And if you need help, let me know. The warm-ups and exit tickets should be used as practice for Monday's exam. As you all know by now, all of the warm-up and exit ticket exam questions are coming from the same item bank. So. Uh, the item bank that we use to build our exams, I take from those that same item bank to make our warm-ups and exit tickets. So it's possible that if you do all of your warm-ups and exit tickets from this unit, we will have, uh, let's see, 14. If you do them all, it's possible that you will see some of those questions on the test. 14 warm-ups and exit tickets means at least 56 questions. So that gives you a good possibility of running into one of the, at least one of the same questions on the test. So expose yourself to it. Give yourself an opportunity to go to, to think it over and then see what the answer is. 
and see what the answer explanation is if you get it wrong. Uh, as of now, we've got seven of you who are scheduled to be here on Monday because you are in the A rotation. So DeAsia, Abina, Lance, JT, Selly, Ashanti, and Araceli, I look forward to meeting you all <laughs> in person and seeing your face and hearing your voice. So I just want to remind you to please bring your laptops and your chargers. Don't be like me. I was totally unprepared yesterday, uh, and my laptop died at the end of class. So, so please make sure that you are doing everything that you need to be able to sit through how many hours of school? Seven and a half. For those of you who will be virtual, either because you're in another rotation or because you have opted into virtual learning for the rest of the school year, be patient with us as we try to figure out what the best way to teach in person and virtual at the same time will be. I know there will be some bumps in the road, but just be patient with your teachers, myself included, and we will, as always, be patient with you all. Uh, lastly, want to remind you that on Tuesday, March 2nd at 3 o'clock p.m., we will have a biology town hall. Come one, come all. This is for your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents. In this class, I believe that I have at least left a voicemail message for everybody, everybody's parents. That doesn't mean that I've spoken to everybody's parents, though I have spoken to the majority of, uh, of your parents, and in some cases, aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins. So uh, we're already on a first name basis. I've invited some of them over for tea this afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, I do encourage you all to get your family members to join that town hall. This will be an opportunity for us to give them an update on what's going on in this class, give them an opportunity to understand how they can help you be successful, not only in this semester, but going forward as we kind of wrap up the school year and prepare for that EOC exam. Uh, so please do join it. You'll be able to meet the other two bio teachers if you haven't. Uh, they might end up being your teachers for another class. Ms. Fields teaches a lot of upper level science classes like chemistry and forensic science. So if you're interested in continuing your science education, then she's going to be a great person to speak to. All right, so be put that on your calendars. Now, I don't bring this up to overwhelm or inundate you guys. That's a good vocab word or to stress you out. So I don't want you to agonize over this. Don't agonize over this impending test on Monday. Don't agonize over the return to school. Do not agonize over this biology town hall. Don't agonize, organize. Get yourself ready, get yourself prepared. Okay, so uh, I give you this information so that you can mentally prepare yourself and be, and be ready to go. Do everything that we're asking of you. You all are totally capable of being A's and A and B students in this class. I've seen enough from each of you to know that that's true. However, some of you, have not yet matched your work ethic with your potential. And that could be for various reasons. Some of us have other things going on in our lives that need to take precedent. I get it. I've been a student before and I remember being stressed out. I remember having other obligations. I remember going through regular teenage black. We all have those moments, I get it. And some of us have more severe moments as well. I'm just asking that you all put your best foot forward uh, even if your best foot is only 80% one day, then you've got to give me 80%. Okay, so let's not dig any deeper holes. Like I said, some of us are really, really up there with quite a few missing assignments. And uh, Power School doesn't lie. Canvas doesn't lie. So if you look and you see uh, on either one of those platforms that you've got more than 10 missing assignments, you need to make sure that you're spending some time this weekend getting something done, even if your grade is good. Because some of you, some because some of you are doing well on the test, it makes your grade look okay, but you still haven't submitted many assignments. So uh, don't be satisfied with mediocrity. Don't be satisfied with that C. You can do better. All right, I'm off my high horse now. I'll step down from the uh, from the podium. One last reminder, we do have a YouTube page that is available to you all 24 seven. And I always make sure that I update the, you, the I upload the, the videos as soon as possible. As you can see, yesterday's video has already been uploaded. I try to upload the videos, you know, no later than 3 p.m. on that day. 
One thing to take note of, though, is there are 28 videos that have been uploaded so far and only 21 views. And probably at least five of those are me, making sure that the videos have been uploaded correctly. So uh, I want you guys to make sure you're using this resource. Just like anything, it is a resource. Just like a hammer, a hammer is not going to do its job by itself. You've got to be the one to pick it up and decide what to do with it and how to use it correctly. That's how we've got to start getting students to think about their education. Your education is just a tool. It can be used for whatever you want it, to, whatever you want to use it for. But it's only going to work if you make it work. You can't just walk into school. You can't just log on and, and feel like you're getting something from it because you're not. You got to use it. You have to manipulate it. You have to put it into context. All right, so this is just one tool that's available to you all. I wanted to provide a reminder. All of our class recordings, except for maybe three, which were you know test days that I didn't record, um, and we weren't introducing any new material, all of those are available on YouTube. Um, yeah, so it's available to you all. Check it out. All right, we're going to jump over to Nearpod now. So please navigate to join.nearpod.com. And enter the code 9LRXV. Let's see if I can, I'm working on two totally different systems today, two different computers, so I can't just copy and paste that. Share.nearpod.com slash 7-F-E-P-B-T-T-W-K-D-B. So that link should work for you. Let's see how many folks. Ah, nobody. It's taking you guys so long. Ab Abigail is the first person. Thanks, Abigail. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, JT. I can't see anything. The code is in the chat, but I will bring it back up. 9LRXV, as in velocity, or velociraptor, or box, or voice or vociferous. <clears throat> All right, we've got eight people so far, but we've got 18 people on the call. So let's get these numbers up, guys. Please don't take too much longer. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, JT, Lisa, Janelle, Dijon, Ashanti, Araceli, Abigail, and Abina. Excellent job. Everybody else, where are we? We're only halfway to the number of people who are in the call. Check back in, please. Let's see who's not here. Aina, where are you? Aina, Aina, Aina. Do I have to call your brothers again to get you to pay attention? Um, I say that because I taught one of Anna's brothers, so. Thanks, Ashanti. I see you've now joined. Melissa's is loading. Osue is loading and being, it's being slow. Where is, okay. Ashley, where are we, Ashley? Deasia? Nico? The screen is white. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on over there, Nico. It's probably just loading. Maybe you need to give it a, uh, the classic refresh. Sienna, where are we? Loading, loading, loading. All right.
I'm going to wait about 15 seconds. All right, 14 of you, let's go ahead and jump into it. So we're going to go standard by standard here. Standard 1.2, homeostasis. Explain how homeostasis is maintained in a cell and within an organism in various environments, including temperature and pH. So when we hear temperature and pH come up, we should be thinking back to unit two, or I'm sorry, unit one, when we talked about enzymes. And we know that enzymes are limited based on their environment's temperature, as well as their environment's pH. Start making those connections. I have this image in my head of you all creating this giant mind map that connects all these concepts from biology. Maybe we'll get you guys to work on that. Those of you who are coming in to school, we'll, we'll get like a big piece of paper, lay it out, and we'll have you all start to draw this mind map connecting these concepts. And uh, we'll figure out a way to, to include the virtual folks as well. But week by week, we'll, we'll just add to it. Weirdly enough, you guys are only going to be here for three weeks, and those of you who are coming in person because of the rotation schedule. So uh, we really only have about nine weeks left in school because of spring break. Uh, so that leaves you with about three weeks each, weirdly enough. All right. First activity is a quiz with two questions. I'm going to give you a minute to do it. These questions should be quick and easy. And the timer is going to start in three, two, one. All right, good job, Abigail, good job, Araceli, Janelle, Dijon, Melissa, Lance, and Lisa, and Ashley, everybody who's answered so far, Tayshawn, Josue, Anna, Nico, uh, JT, let's get some answers. We've got 20 seconds left, 20 seconds. Ten seconds left. Let's at least get... Some answers recorded. Thanks, Tayshawn. Thanks, Josue, Nico, and JT. Thanks, uh, Abina. All right. I'm going to share the results with you all. So you see, we did pretty well. Uh, 64 questions correct, 25 incorrect, and 11 unanswered. 
First question asks, which of the following is the definition of homeostasis? Of course, homeostasis, if we break that down and we think about the root words, homeo refers to man, just like homo sapiens. Stasis refers to stable, balance. So what we're talking about here is the maintenance of an internal balance, to maintain an internal balance. That's what homeostasis means. The second question asked you, which of the eight essential life processes, which we use the acronym STERGER to describe, is most associated with homeostasis? That first R, regulation, is the answer there. Regulation, of course, means to maintain something, to have control over it, to limit how much it can change. So this is limit, this is describing a balance, to maintain an internal balance. We've been talking about that since unit zero. But good job to those, those of you who got it right. And thank you to those of you who didn't get it right for answering. All right, here's a collaborate board. And it's going to ask this question. I want you to just stop, think, and answer after you've taken some time to think about it. The question is, why is it important that cells and living organisms maintain homeostasis? How does homeostasis help these living organisms to survive? Think about that and share your answers with me. Once we start getting some answers shared, feel free to like people's responses if you were like, oh, I was getting ready to say that. So let's take about mm, three more minutes to get some answers here. Cool, Ashley, thank you. It helps animals maintain stability. That's true. So they can have a way to live. Thanks, Lisa. If there isn't a balance in things, things start going into chaos. Now that is an advanced thought. Lance, thank you for sharing that. That gets into some physics, uh, this idea of entropy. Things are always more likely to become more chaotic so that the cells in the body continue to function properly. Janelle, is, you're on the right track as to what I'm thinking about. You and I are connecting. Here come the answers now. Tayshawn, maintaining a constant internal balance by providing the cells with what they need to survive. Good. It can help them survive since it helps them maintain internal stability to prevent any future internal problems. Thank you, Josue. JT, it helps maintain balance in an environment. That's true, but why? Why is it important that they do that? So that the body doesn't overheat and it functions correctly. Excellent. For the body to keep temperature and to keep balance. Thanks, Nico. What I really wanna think about folks our enzymes, our body is so, our cells, each individual cell is so reliant upon enzymes. We don't wanna expose ourselves too much to our environment because we have enzymes that can only work in very, very specific conditions. If we get too hot, then certain enzymes in our body just aren't gonna work well. This is why it's really bad when you are really feverish. If your fever goes above a certain level, you basically, you need to get cooled down quickly. Otherwise, it can become very bad for your body because things start to shut down. Your enzymes are not working. Same thing, your body gets too cold. Our, many enzymes need to be right up there near 100 degrees Fahrenheit in order to be functioning properly. So quickly, if it gets too cold, they, start, they stop to function. They stop functioning. All right, so think about enzymes as it relates to this concept. But I love the fact that you all were so willing to share and we were really on, on the right track here. So good job, let's keep it going. So here are the properties of cell membranes that we discussed. There are four important properties. Actually, let me go back really quickly. I'm gonna add an activity here. Open it, 
question. All right, so just a little bit more review. I'm just gonna add an open-ended question here and see how you all respond. Two questions, actually. Why do we refer to enzymes as, quote, specific? And why do we refer to enzymes as, quote, reusable? So go ahead and share your answers there. Let's not take too much time here. So it doesn't need to be a perfect response. It doesn't need to be a full sentence. Let's just get something recorded. All right, we've got 36% participation here, 36%. So I've got answers from five people. Good job, Ashley, Josue, Tayshawn, Lance, Melissa, JT, Abigail. Excellent job. Wonderful, good job. Wonderful. All right, let's take maybe 15 seconds to get an answer in. I know we probably still have some folks who are typing. Okay, good job, folks. Excellent. Uh, let's see, whose answer do I want to share here? I'm going to share Araceli's answer today, or for this question. Enzymes are specific because they only work for one thing, and they are reusable because they are unchanged in a chemical reaction. I'm going to also choose to share... JT, I like this use of the phrase active site in JT's answer. 
They're specific because they need to work with certain substrates, I love that word too, that can fit in the active site. Enzymes can be reused when they're active site. Uh, okay, now that second sentence, JT, we wanna be careful. We don't wanna see any changes in the active site. Let's look at this answer from Abigail. Uh, they're reusable because the active site stays the same after it breaks down substrates. That's what we wanna focus on. The enzyme is unchanged. Its active site does not get changed when it goes through a reaction. And as Janelle says, that means that they can be used again and again. Good job, folks. All right, I love that. Let's close this activity out. So we were talking about the properties of the cell membrane, and hopefully that comes up on your screen soon. The properties of the cell membrane allow it to be, to take certain things in and to let certain things out. Number one, the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, which means it's made up of two layers of lipids. We're gonna talk more about that. The cell membrane is flexible and fluid, which means that not only does it allow the cell to move, but things that are embedded inside of the cell membrane can also move around. The fact that it has things embedded inside of it make the cell membrane a mosaic. A mosaic is typically a work of art that is consistent of many different pieces. Kind of like if I were to shatter some tile and then just kind of try to piece it back together in a random order, there's a mosaic. If I had many different types of tiles, that's an even better mosaic. So this cell membrane has different substances embedded inside of it, which we'll see on the next slide. The cell membrane is lastly selectively permeable, which means that it decides what can come in and what can go out. It's picky, it's choosy. It's like, uh, well, you guys aren't old enough to go to like clubs or anything yet, but you get to the club, there's a bouncer there. He's like, yeah, that friend group can come in. No, that you, you're by yourself, you can't come in. You gotta go get some friends to bring in with you. Uh, don't like what you're wearing. You, can, you can't come in, but that guy who's wearing the exact same thing as you, he can come in for various reasons. So all these things are taken into account by the cell membrane. They let certain things in and they don't let other things in. They let certain things out and they don't let other things out. This allows the cell membrane to create concentration gradients, which we've talked about before. Okay, so here's an image of the cell membrane as a mosaic. We see number one, the phospholipid bilayer. We can see these yellow balls. They represent the phosphate head, which is hydrophilic. But we can also see these little brown noodle looking tails. Those are the hydrophobic tails. They don't like water. We're gonna talk more about that as well. But we can see that all of these things are embedded inside of the membrane. I see three of the four biological macromolecules here. I see proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. The only thing I don't see is a nucleic acid. So I'm gonna ask another open-ended question here. Let's see, you guys hopefully can think back to unit one. It was about a month ago. This question's taking a while to pop up, but the question is, what are the monomers of carbs and lipids and proteins? What are those respective monomers? This should be another quick one. All right, I've got answers from two people, both of whom are correct. Good job, let's keep it rolling. Let's get some more answers coming in.
good. We've got over half of you now who've given answers. Let's take 15 seconds. Ashley, Tayshawn, Lisa, Lance, Abina, Nico. We can get some answers from you guys. I will be a happy, happy teacher. All right, I'm gonna to choose to share Josue's answer here. I like how he worded it. So carbs, their monomer is a monosaccharide. Where did it go? Yeah, lipids, their monomer is glycerol and three fatty acids. And then proteins, their monomer is called an amino acid. Excellent job, Josue. And for the record, looks like everybody got the answer right. Some of you struggled with spelling. That's okay, this is not the national spelling bee. Uh, but you, you've got the gist. Good job. All right, we're going to end this activity. Now, if you're interested in knowing what these things actually do in the cell membrane, you can take AP Biology, where we do talk about these more in depth. But for now, the really, the, really the only two that we need to know, carbs are like antenna. These carbohydrates stick out and they help to identify the cell. They talk to other cells. They say, hey, this cell is in charge of doing this or this cell is tasked with doing this. And then channel proteins. These are tunnels, as we can kind of see here. This, this is a tunnel that's gonna allow things to go in and out of the cell. All right. Cool. These phrases, hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Now, most of you will go on to take chemistry, I assume. You're honor students, so I would not recommend you take physical uh, science. Just go ahead and take chemistry and get exposed to it. Uh, but when you take chemistry, you'll learn about why certain things are hydrophobic and why others are hydrophilic. It has to do with this concept of polarity which you've heard me talk about before. But nonpolar substances do not like water. So these are like your oils. This is why oil, water and oil don't mix. Water is polar. Oil is nonpolar. They don't like each other. So these substances are considered hydrophobic, whereas other substances are hydrophilic. This is why water carries electrical charge so well. This is why if it, if you're out at the lake or uh, you know, you're on the coast at the beach and you're in the water and it starts to rain, you should get out of the water quickly because water carries electrical currents really well. And if lightning strikes, it could mean bad news for you if you're you know, within 10 to 20 feet of that, of that touchdown. Because electrical current is, a, is, is polar. And so it really likes water. Polar substances really, really like water. This is why ions like water. Potassium, sodium, calcium, salt is an, is an ionic compound. So it really likes water. You'll talk more about the chemical properties behind that in chemistry. But hydrophobic describes the region of the cell membrane that faces inward because it needs to insulate itself as much as possible from water. It doesn't want to run into it. Whereas the hydrophilic regions face outward, they do like water. We can see that here. These red balls represent the hydrophilic heads. They face outward, whereas the hydrophobic tails face inward. So take this in, it's a beautiful sight. It's amazing how science is able to create things like this. All right. So because of these concepts and properties of polarity, certain things are able to get through the membrane easily. Nonpolar molecules can easily fit through the membrane if they're small enough because 
the inside of the membrane is also nonpolar. So it has no problem letting the little guys who are nonpolar in. Whereas large molecules like proteins are not able to get through because they're just simply too big. Polar molecules like water, H2O, can't get through because the inside of the membrane is hydrophobic. So it doesn't like polar substances. Charged molecules are polar substances. So again, they cannot get through the membrane. This would be sodium, potassium, calcium, and other ions that our, our cells need. And here are some other examples. Glucose is relatively large, so it can't get through by itself. NaCl is a type of salt. It's table salt, the salt that you, most of you probably use at one point or another for cooking purposes. Uh, it's polar. So it doesn't like, doesn't like the inside of the membrane. We've seen that table before, nothing new here, just giving you all an opportunity to look at your notes and say, oh, I missed that, oh, I wrote that incorrectly last time, and just to clarify. Something standard was about photosynthesis and respiration. Students were to analyze photosynthesis and cellular respiration in terms of how energy is stored, released, and transferred within and between systems. Let's take a look. We're gonna watch a video, and at, at five different points in the video, five or six, you guys will be stopped and uh, you'll be given a question to answer. So please pay attention throughout the entire video. The information that you need to answer these things <clears throat> will come up in the videos or in the video. As you know, life is made of carbon compounds. We will see how the element carbon is taken in as carbon dioxide by plants, used and reused by all living things, before being respired back into the environment as carbon dioxide once again. So let's start with the gas carbon dioxide. Do you know how much there is of it in the air? Well, the air contains nearly 0.04% carbon dioxide. But hundreds of years ago, before we started using fossil fuels, it was only 0.28%. Not much, you might think, but enough to enable plants to build up all the structures they need with a little help from the water and minerals they take up from their roots and energy from the sun. Plants use the sunlight to pull oxygen away from water and carbon dioxide, allowing the plant to capture the carbon. This happens in the green chloroplasts found in the leaves of plants. What is the All right, so your first question here is just a true or false question, so it should be pretty quick. True or false, animal cells also have chloroplasts. I've got answers from a little over half of you, so probably eight people. So that means six people still need to answer. This should be a quick one. Ten seconds, ten seconds, ten seconds. Five. Okay. All right, so of course this one is false. Animal cells do not have chloroplasts because animal cells do not need to do photosynthesis. Animals like you and I and plants are, no, I'm sorry, animals like you and I are heterotrophic organisms. We can go out and get our own food. We can eat 
uh, plants, berries, and other animals. Plants, of course, for the most part, are not eating other species. So they need to make their own food. And the process by which they make their own food is, of course, called, well, we'll find out shortly. What is the name of this reaction? Perhaps the most important chemical reaction on the planet. Pause the video whilst you think of your answer. It is photosynthesis. Well done if you got it right. All right, what does photosynthesis mean? This is an easy multiple choice question. It should be easy. Come on, folks, let's get some more answers coming in here. This should be an easy one. What does photosynthesis mean? Looks like I've got answers from just over a third of you. So probably five people or so. Let's get some more answers, please. Seven of you now. All right, I'm going to share the solution now. Hopefully we aren't starting to have folks fall off. Everyone should be still here and paying attention. Okay, so the solution here, of course, is using sunlight to make food. Now, I had a lot of people in my last class confuse it with using sunlight to make energy. We do not use sunlight to make energy. Uh, that is skipping a step. First, we need to make food, and then we can use that food to make energy. So don't skip that step. That's, that's an important one. Excuse me. Let's keep going. Photo means light, and synthesis means building up. However, in its simplest terms, we are actually breaking carbon dioxide apart, releasing the reactive gas oxygen into the environment, allowing the carbon to be captured by the plants to build up their structures as they grow. Animals, in their turn, get carbon by eating plants or other animals. All this, of course, requires energy. In order to fuel these living processes, plants and animals take back oxygen from the air and rejoin it with the carbon, releasing carbon dioxide back into the environment. Do you know the name of this energy releasing process? Paul? Okay, what's the name of this energy releasing process in which oxygen and glucose are used to make energy? What is the name of the process in which oxygen and glucose are used to make energy?
All right, we've got an answer from half of you, a little over half. Excellent, 93%, good job. All right, so this is, well, we've got people saying ATP, the name of the energy releasing process in which uh, we got a full sentence answer from Ashanti, excellent job. I'm sharing Ashanti's answer because she's right and it looks good. Cellular respiration is the correct answer. Most of you did say that, but several of you said ATP. ATP is not, not the name of the process. ATP is the name of the energy that is made through the process. So you're on the right track there. Pause the video whilst you think of your answer. Well, it's called respiration. And here is a simple representation of the two processes. First of all, sunlight breaks the bonds, allowing the carbon dioxide and water to form oxygen and carbohydrate, which is a compound of carbon and hydro or water hence CH2O, a simple representation of the carbohydrate molecule. That's photosynthesis. Energy is now stored and living things can use the carbohydrate to build their bodies and structures. To obtain energy, they simply reverse this reaction, letting the oxygen and the carbohydrate to rejoin, forming carbon dioxide and water all over again. And this is respiration. Let's look at these two processes more closely. They both need catalysts to enable them to work at normal temperatures. Okay, what is another word for a biological catalyst? This should be a quick one. We just talked about them. Okay, let's get some more answers, folks. Only 33% of us. Come on, we can do better than that. Okay, excellent. So we've got a lot of the correct answers, but I'm going to sh choose to share. Let's see, who have I not shared yet? Tayshawn, that's a good, good answer. Simple, enzyme. Correct, good job. These catalysts are called enzymes. Photosynthesis also needs a pigment called chlorophyll. The active site is a magnesium atom colored green in this model, which absorbs blue and red light from the sun spectrum to drive the photosynthesis reactions, leaving the green light to be reflected, making the leaves look well green. The reaction takes place by a number of complex stages. It's a reaction which evolved early on in the lifetime of our planet, and the blue-green algae, also known as cyanobacteria, are still alive today, living in the sea. 
The chloroplasts you find in the green leaves of plants evolved from these simple bacteria. If only we could find a way to use sunlight to split carbon dioxide and water to make fuel and oxygen for ourselves, we could solve our green energy problems. Scientists are trying to find alternative catalysts to chlorophyll, but if there was a better catalyst, maybe life would have evolved it already. Respiration also needs a series of enzymes to enable oxygen to reach. All right, so another question here. This is the last one. What are the products of cellular respiration? Multiple choice question here. Think deeply about it. Think deeply. Think about what humans need in order for us to make energy. Okay, we've got just under half of you, so I think that means seven folks. Now eight folks. Let's keep getting some answers in. Let's say 15 more seconds. All right, so we had an answer for at least every answer choice. At least one person said every answer choice, but most of you did say the correct answer, which is A, carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Um, of course, energy needed to be produced from cellular respiration, so that was an option in all of the answer choices. But uh, we did also include carbon dioxide and water. That's what we uh, produce as a result of cellular respiration. Good job. All right, so this video does keep going, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to move on. For those of you who are struggling to remember chloroplast and, I'm sorry, to remember photosynthesis and cell respiration, think about it being a cycle. What one needs is what the other produces. And what the other produces is what that one needs. So, for example, chloroplasts need carbon dioxide, water, and light energy to make food. And the food that they make is called glucose, or carbohydrates, as well as oxygen. Mitochondria need glucose and oxygen to make chemical energy. And in the process of making that energy, they also, as a byproduct, make water and carbon dioxide. So that's truly the cycle that we're seeing here and we can also witness that cycle here in the chemical reactions. If we go from left to right, we can see the chemical equation for photosynthesis. If we go from right to left, we see that one for cellular respiration. So I really encourage you guys to you know, think about it this way. Take a picture of this if you really need to study it to understand it. All right, moving on. 4.2.2, active transport and homeostasis. We've only got about five minutes left, so I won't spend too much time talking about this one. However, 
passive transport does not require energy to move molecules with their concentration gradient. So from high to low, no energy is required in order to do this. It's like rolling down a hill. There are three types of passive transport that we focus on in this level of biology. Simple diffusion, which moves the smallest nonpolar molecules. This means that they don't need any help getting through the membrane. They just kind of slip through. Facilitated diffusion, on the other hand, helps move molecules that do need a little bit of help. Again, we're still not talking about using any energy, but they just need a tunnel to kind of travel through. But the most important type of passive transport is osmosis, which is defined as the movement of water through the membrane. Water does require a protein called an aquaporin to move through the membrane because it is polar. So even though it doesn't need energy, it still needs the help of that protein. And again, passive transport is like rolling a ball down a hill. We start off from a region that is high in concentration and we end up at a region that is low in concentration. All right. Then active transport, oh, we also talked about solutes, solvents, and solutions as well. When you mix a solute into a solvent, they make a solution. If my solute is salt and my solvent is water, when I mix them, I create salt water. There's your solution. Talked about that as well. We've talked about the fact that the solute percentage must add up with the solvent percentage to equal 100%. So if I know one, then I can easily calculate the other. If I know the solute percentage, then I can easily calculate the solvent percentage. In terms of osmosis, water will move from areas where it is in a high concentration to areas where it is in a low concentration. Keep that in mind. Okay. Active transport uses ATP to pump molecules against their gradient. And this is why I like to focus on the three A's. Active transport uses ATP, which is cellular energy, to pump molecules against their gradient. There are your three A's. Against the gradient just means from low to high like trying to push a ball up a hill from an area or a region where it is in low concentration to a region where it is in high concentration. We did in this class talk about these four examples of active transport, sodium potassium pump, synthesizing molecules, endocytosis and exocytosis, and excretion of toxins. These are all active processes active transport processes. You don't really know or need to know what's happening in each of them, but just that, uh, again, when we see this word pump, as in sodium potassium pump, we should be thinking about using energy. When we think about taking in really large things via uh, endocytosis or getting rid of large things via exocytosis or excretion, because they're so big, it typically requires energy to do that. Same thing with synthesizing molecules. We'll talk more about that in unit five. We don't have time for this Kahoot right now, but we will play it on Monday. Uh, there is an exit ticket. I did not add any new asynchronous assignments today. So all you need to focus on are the five that I've already given you. Uh, I know that most of you have already made progress with at least a couple of them, but please, if you know that you're missing a lot of assignments, don't dig yourself any deeper in the hole. Go ahead and knock these assignments out now, this weekend. We're getting to that one more unit before the midterm exam. The midterm is worth a good chunk of your grade, guys. So you want to make sure you've done these assignments to put yourself in, your, in the best possible position to do well on the exam. All right. Well, it's 1.19, but I will let you guys go a minute early. Thank you for your participation today. I do like these Nearpods. Uh, those of you who did participate, some of you were just kind of here. Who knows what you were doing? But I'll talk to you all on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. Peace out.